Okay. Now, uh, as we look into this uh, PowerPoint slide, uh, these are the topics that we have uh, covered uh, up to this point where we cover up to number eight. So basically, uh, we have come to almost the end of our, our sessions. Uh, I may just run through with you on uh, titles of God so that to just make a quick revision on what we have studied the last week. Okay, uh, let's look at this. Just to refresh our memory, okay, uh, these were the 10 things uh, that we discussed uh, concerning the titles of the Son of God. We have mentioned that uh, Jesus Christ is called Son of God uh, because he came directly from God, just like Adam. Okay? And the spirit that was in Jesus Christ uh, is the spirit of God. So therefore, since he came directly from God, uh, he is called Son of God as prophesied in the Bible in, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now, the reason why Jesus Christ had to come uh, is because under the law set by God, uh, for sins uh, to be redeemed, uh, there has to be a sacrifice of something that is sinless. In the Old Testament, what they do is that they use a calf or a bull uh, in substitute for the sins of man. But we note that in Hebrews chapter 10, it says that the John got feedback. He says that the sins of booze and all these things are, are useless. You cannot uh, wash away the sins uh, of man uh, by a sacrifice of booze. And so, according to the plan of God, uh, God has already planned for a sinless man to be born. Okay. And according to Hebrews uh, chapter 9, this sinner sacrifice uh, is, of course, uh, God himself coming in the form of flesh. Because man, uh, any person who is born of man, uh, in Psalm chapter 51 verse 5, uh, is born in sin. So the only way uh, for, for it to have a sinner sacrifice uh, is to be God, coming in the form of flesh. Now, why we say Jesus Christ is God coming in the form of flesh? We are saying that because the spirit in Jesus Christ is the spirit of God himself. As you have noted, uh, that when Jesus Christ was conceived, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. So, if the spirit in Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit himself, is God, the spirit of God himself, uh, okay? therefore, Jesus Christ is really the image of God himself. Okay, so the condition set by God uh, for sin and pardon is that for this man and Jesus sacrificed that. So we say that Jesus Christ is the second Adam and that according to prophecy, uh, the Messiah to be born will be born of man and the Messiah, uh, the Bible records in chapter 9 verse 6, uh, will be the everlasting father, the prince of peace, uh, and the comforter, okay, so a counselor, wonderful counselor. All these are representations of the title of, of God Himself, okay. So now He lived um, as a man and therefore He is able to sympathize with us. We also say that our Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of Man because why? He was born in the flesh and therefore we call Him the Son of Man. And the reason why He was born as a son of man uh, for the sacrifice because obviously God cannot die. Okay? So, but a sinner sacrifice can die because that sinner sacrifice is a man. Okay? So, and that because Jesus Christ was born as a man, uh, he was able to sympathize with our weaknesses our difficult, and, and able to leave us human footsteps for us to follow in the sense that we cannot say now uh, that, uh, oh, no, you are God. We cannot, we, we, we cannot follow you because you are God. Of course, you can do it. But Jesus Christ lived as a man. And he lived his footsteps uh, for us to follow. So, son of God and son of man are titled to describe the role he played for the salvation plan of God. 
son of God to tell him that I am the Messiah. I come from God. I am the second Adam. Okay. And then son of man, uh, I am the sacrifice. Okay. I will die for your sins. So these are the titles to describe uh, the in the salvation plan of God. We also mentioned that Jesus Christ prayed to the Father and received uh, uh, confirmation for our sins. That means Jesus Christ when he pray, if you say that he is God himself, why do he need to pray? Uh, the Bible that we have read uh, tells us that uh, he prayed, uh, there was a voice from heaven, and when we pray, this voice from heaven uh, came, uh, and Jesus Christ says, uh, this voice came from heaven was for your sake, not for me, but for you all. So what it means to say is that uh, Jesus Christ is praying as an example for us uh, to show that his prayer is accepted by God. Uh, the voice of heaven come to him, come to us for us to see. But Jesus Christ says, this is for your sake, not for me. Okay? Jesus Christ doesn't need to pray, but he confirmed that this spirit uh, uh, that he has inside him is the spirit of God. And when he pray, the voice confirmed that he comes from God. For us, in our human form, uh, uh, what we are to take is that, uh, okay, it is to understand uh, that Jesus Christ was praying to set us an example because Jesus Christ just said, this voice was for your sake. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? Now, in the Bible, we mentioned that uh, 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 God is spirit, but then the Bible also said that the spirit of Jesus Christ and the spirit of the Father so if there is the Holy Spirit and there's the Spirit of Father and there's the Spirit of Jesus, how many spirits are there? Uh, we have mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, to say that there is only one Spirit. We have also shown many verses uh, to show that uh, the, 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 the use of Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus Christ has been used interchangeably. For example, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, uh, it clearly says that uh, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to God. So how is it possible uh, that we ask her uh, to pray for the Holy Spirit? So aren't we supposed to receive the Holy Spirit? But why then uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, to tell us uh, that if you do not have the Spirit of Jesus, uh, you do not belong to God, then how is it possible? So if you read all these things, uh, to understand in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, that there is only one spirit. Meaning to say the spirit of Jesus and the spirit, the Holy Spirit, they have been used interchangeably. I've shown many verses uh, uh, in Acts, uh, which tells us uh, where the use of Holy Spirit and use the spirit of Jesus has been used uh, interchangeably, sometimes even in the same verse itself. So uh, you, you go back to the previous lesson that they learned. So, now what we are saying now is that, uh, in conclusion, uh, the Spirit in Jesus uh, is the Spirit of God Himself. That's why Jesus Christ says, uh, I am in the Father and the Father in me. This is a very strange word. How could He be in the Father and the Father in me? The only way we can understand it is, uh, is that the Spirit that was in Jesus Christ is the Spirit of God himself, I mean the Spirit of the Father, so that the Father in me is possible. I am in the Father. Why I am in the Father? Because Jesus Christ is the representation of the Father himself. That's why he told Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So I am in the Father. Okay. So this we have uh, covered up uh, today. Now we're going to go on to the next session. Uh, Okay, no, not this one, sorry. We have covered this. Okay. Now, the big question, is Jesus God himself? Just now in the sessions that we have out covered, we have, you know, from various Bible verses to say that Jesus Christ is God himself. But how do we know Okay, for, for sure, how do we know that Jesus Christ is God himself? The reason is because, uh, very clearly, the Bible says so. Okay, we turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. 
Oh, Priska, welcome. <laughs> okay, oh, Yi Yang, you're here. So, uh, okay, um, can we have Brad John? Can you read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6? Okay. okay, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Verse 6. For us, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So here it's very clearly stated, uh, who is this person that is reborn? Here it tells you that this person is born is a wonderful counselor. Obviously, that refers to the Holy Spirit. The Mighty God, we know that he is God. The Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. So the Bible uh, makes a very clear reference uh, that this person, this son that's been born, the child that's been given, uh, is going to be the everlasting father, the wonderful counselor, and the mighty God. So is Jesus Christ God himself? From this verse, it's very clear that it is Jesus Christ is God himself. Now I've gone to the YouTube uh, to, to see many debates. Uh, uh, and I hardly see any uh, Christians uh, or even the, the Jews uh, themselves uh, in their debates uh, using these words. You know, <laughs> None, no, I've never seen anybody uh, uh, in, on the internet uh, where they use these words itself. I'm not very sure why. Uh, obviously, for those who believe in Trinity, they'll never use these words because these words uh, tell us uh, Jesus Christ is all of these people, okay? All of this. And the Jews uh, will never accept Jesus Christ as God himself. <laughs> so, this is a very powerful word uh, for us to use uh, in our discussion with our friends uh, in relation to who is Jesus Christ, okay? Especially when you want to uh, talk to those Trinitarians. Uh, uh, this verse, please remember by heart. Okay. Now, the second reason uh, why we say that the Bible says so uh, is because Jesus Christ himself said this. Okay. We turn to John chapter 14, verse 8 to 10. Uh, Sister Jenny, John chapter 14, verse 8 to 10. John chapter 14, verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Okay, thank you very much. Now, here, Jesus Christ <laughs> told Philip, you know, how can you ask me to show your Father? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. It's a clear direction uh, that Jesus Christ is telling the disciples, you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Of course, at that moment of time, uh, many of disciples still could not really accept these words uh, okay, as to whether he's God himself. Because when he was crucified, uh, many of them ran away. You know, they, they, they escaped. They were scared for their lives. They couldn't really accept that Jesus Christ was God himself, even after Jesus Christ said this. But as you have read, uh, the words that I speak to you is the Father is speaking. You know, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? Basically, he's telling the disciples, uh, the spirit that is in me is the spirit of God himself. And that's why I'm able to speak to you the words of the Father. You know, all of us got spirit. Okay, we have our own spirit. But the spirit that is in Jesus Christ uh, is the spirit of God himself. That makes him God himself. There is a big difference between us. Now, we mentioned uh, that uh, 
at the time uh, when these guys speak these words, you know, who has seen me has seen the father. Many of the disciples were still not very sure. Okay, especially uh, there was this disciple called Thomas. Thomas uh, uh, was not there when Jesus Christ revealed himself to disciples after the resurrection. So he said that unless I touch, okay, unless I touch, you know, uh, unless I touch uh, the, the wound on his, on his side and feel his hand, uh, the, the hole on his hand, uh, then I can believe. So what happened was that in John chapter 20, verse 28 to 29, John chapter 20, verse 28 to 29, uh, Sister Maria, can you read? John chapter 20, verse 28 to 29. Um, John chapter 20, verse 28 to 29, in the name of Lord Christ, I read. Uh, verse 28, my Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Verse 29, then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Okay. Now you see, uh, Thomas was questioning. That's why people call uh, I'll uh, give a nickname uh, to Thomas called Doubting Thomas. Okay? But when, when Jesus Christ revealed himself, uh, Thomas says, uh, my Lord and my God. You, you must understand that the Jews uh, take very seriously who is their God. Okay? Uh, they always, in their prayers, uh, uh, they have this, uh, this, this prayer which they have to pray uh, who is their God and all these things. Uh, uh, I can't remember a name they, they, they used to think. But in their worship, uh, they reveal God uh, very sincerely. For Thomas to say, uh, my Lord and my God, uh, it means to say, sir, he has now acknowledged uh, that Jesus Christ is his God. So, why is this Christ God himself? After his resurrection, uh, his disciples now understand uh, that Jesus Christ is actually God himself. It is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, uh, where the Messiah, the, to be clear, is actually the mighty God, the everlasting Father. And so therefore, Thomas, uh, now after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, could fully understand uh, that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my God. Okay. Now the next question uh, are there more than one person that form one God? Obviously not. Okay. Now we have read this verse before, uh, but never mind, we read this again. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. Uh, Sister Junsi, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 4, four verse 4 to 6. Yeah. Chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. In the name of Jesus, I read. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. Now, uh, this verse uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, uh, uh, also please. Uh, remember this by heart uh, <laughs> because this is where you find the seven ones uh, okay and the seven ones uh, okay uh, basically it talks about there's only one okay it's one okay like for example there's one body that means there's one church there's one spirit that means only one spirit okay one god one father one lord so here when we look at here we can see here, uh, it's clear second that there is one God, one Father. Now, of course, uh, although it said one God, one Father, one, this Spirit, Father, God, these are titles of the persons. All of this could be referring to the same person. Okay, all of this could be referring to the same person. But what it basically means to say is that uh, if you are referring to God, there is only 
one God. Now, the Bible has many references uh, uh, whereby God says, uh, I am the one and only. Beside me, there is no other God. Okay? So, are there more than one person forming God? From this verse, you can see, no. Okay? Because there is only one God, one Father, one Lord. Okay? It cannot be, if you believe that there are more than one persons forming God, uh, because why? Especially the Trinitarians, they believe that they are there's the Father. But Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 declare, is declared as the everlasting Father. So if you accept Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, then Jesus Christ is another Father. So there are more than one Father okay, if you believe in Trinity. But if you do not believe in Trinity and believe in actually one true God, uh, and you believe that Jesus Christ is that God himself, who is also the Father, then this verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, would make sense. Okay, Jesus Christ is the Father. He is the one God. He is also the one Lord. You remember, okay, uh, Thomas mentioned, uh, my Lord and my God. It doesn't mean, uh, my Lord and my God, uh, that there are two persons, no. My Lord and my God refers to one person, who is Jesus Christ. So when you say, when there's a reference of my Lord, my God, uh, it doesn't mean there are two persons. It's just that, mean to say there are two titles given to that one person. And that one person is Jesus Christ himself. Okay, so when you see one body, one spirit, okay, one Father, one Lord, it refers to God himself. Of course, the one body refers to the church. Okay. Now, let's look at the other question. Of whether there is Jesus Christ is God himself. We have accepted that in Genesis chapter 1, God created the world. But we also look in, 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 in John chapter 1, verse 2, it tells us that uh, all things were created through him, through Jesus Christ. So who created the world? Is it who created the world? We say that God created the world. But in John chapter 1, verse 2, it tells us that it's Jesus Christ who created the world. So Jesus Christ is the creator. And if Jesus Christ is the creator, therefore he is God himself. We turn to one verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5 to 6. Brother Tom? 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5 to 6. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5 to 6. Uh, Brother Tom? Can you hear me now? Ah, okay, can, can hear you now. Uh, uh, First Corinthians 8, verse mm -hmm. 5. For even if they are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed they are many gods and many lords. Verse 6, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and from whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Okay. Now here, especially verse 6, uh, it's very clear from this verse uh, okay, that Jesus Christ is through whom all things and through whom all things we exist. That means God, Jesus Christ is the creator. But it's interesting to note uh, in chapter 6, uh, it also confirms uh, yet for us there is one God one Father, the Father, from whom all things are and from whom things exist. So it is to tell us that there's only one Father, one Lord. But if Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 uh, says that Jesus Christ is the everlasting Father, then it connects to us uh, that this Father is Jesus Christ himself. 
Of course, this verse in verse 6 uh, says that Jesus Christ is the creator because it's through whom all things and through whom we exist. Jesus Christ is the creator. Okay. So Jesus Christ, if he is a creator, he is God himself. The next thing uh, that we have to, uh, we will understand uh, that Jesus Christ is God himself uh, is because Jesus Christ himself uh, accepts worship. Now, take note of one thing. Uh, we note uh, in Exodus chapter 20, <laughs> verse 4 to 6, uh, okay, verse 4 to 6, uh, it tells us uh, that uh, we are not allowed to worship any other gods. You know? okay. This is the Ten Commandments. So, uh, this Ten Commandments is very famous. I, I will not ask you to read that, uh, but you can find in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 to 6, uh, where God says, you shall not have unto thee any other gods. You, know? you cannot worship other gods. You, know? you cannot, you're not allowed to worship other gods. So, if that is the case, uh, Jesus Christ himself accept worship. Let's turn to this verse. Uh. Okay, uh, this verse first, uh, where we can clearly see uh, that uh, even angels uh, or very powerful beings uh, do not accept worship. Let's turn to Revelations chapter 22, verse 8 to 9. Revelations chapter 22, verse 8 to 9. Uh, Brother Go Yiyang. Yiyang. Uh, 启示录二十二章八节到 Mm, here, here you see, uh, John uh, saw this saw this vision. Uh, and what happened was that uh, when John saw this vision, uh, he fell down. Uh, now actually, whether he saw a vision or he actually saw an angel, we don't know. Uh, but what we can see down here was that uh, he saw an angel. And because the angel is so glorious, uh, so powerful looking, he fell down at the feet uh, and worshipped. He wanted to worship the angel, you know. But the angel told him, you must not do that, you know. Okay, I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades, uh, and with those who keep the words of God, worship God. Okay, so the angel told him, uh, you can only worship God, you know. So it's very clear uh, that other than God, uh, none of us uh, can accept the worship from anybody. But we turn to John chapter 9, uh, Verse 38 to 40. Uh, turn to John chapter 9, verse 38 to 40. Uh, Priska, Priska, can you read? Priska? Oh, hello. Oh, John chapter... John chapter 9, verse 38 to 40. 38 to 40, all right. Uh, in Jesus' name I read, and he said, Lord, I believe, I believed, and he worshipped him. 39, and Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not, not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Okay. So here, here you can see, uh, uh, and Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, I am come to for judgment that they see other things. Now, you can clearly see here that Jesus Christ accepts worship, you know. Now, no way in the Bible any other servant of God uh, accept worship. Okay, no way in the Bible. Okay. So only Jesus Christ accept worship. Now we can see another part of the Bible uh, which tells us about this as well. In Matthew chapter uh, 28, verse 16. To 17. Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 16 to 17. Uh, Sister Maria? Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 17. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 to 17, in the name of Lord Christ, I read. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Now you see, uh, here it tells us, uh, it's not one disciple, you know. He said, they worship him. So after Jesus Christ was resurrected, uh, you can see uh, that now they understood uh, who Jesus Christ is already. And here you can tell us very clearly, uh, the disciples uh, worship him, you know. Now it's a different thing uh, if you've got a disciple and master relationship. Uh, if the master is just a man, you don't worship your master because he's not God. But in the case of disciples, uh, they worship him. Just like what Thomas did. He worshiped God and is worshiped Jesus Christ and said, My Lord and my God. Okay. So the disciples uh, themselves uh, very clearly understand. It's not, it's not just not Thomas, you know. It is here it clearly uh, that uh, all the disciples worship Jesus Christ. So the status of Jesus Christ uh, after his resurrection has been changed from just a mere master to God himself. Okay. Now, we can also see uh, from the Bible uh, how the Bible teaches us uh, the status of Jesus Christ uh, to us Christian. To us Christian. Okay. What is, how should we uh, look at Jesus Christ? Okay. Who is Jesus Christ to us when we uh, worship we turn to this verse in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. Uh, June, can you read? Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 to 11. In the name of Jesus, I read. Philippians 2, verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, uh, this verse uh, is something that is written by Paul. Now, we know that Paul wrote uh, 13 of the 27 books uh, in the New Testament. And many of his teachings uh, become the teachings for us uh, how our conduct uh, in life should be as a Christian. And Paul here says, uh, at every knee should bow, you know, every knee should bow, confessing uh, that Jesus Christ uh, is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. What does that mean? When you bow down on knee, that means you're worshipping. Okay? You bow down on knee, you're worshipping. You, that means it says that every Christian has to bow down, has to worship Jesus Christ, uh, and verse 11 says, uh, to the glory of God the Father. So the status of Jesus Christ is not a simple thing. You know. He is telling us, uh, you should worship Jesus Christ and treat his glory as if he is God the Father. So is Jesus Christ God the Father? Yes, Jesus Christ is God himself. Now we turn to another verse in the Bible. What happens uh, after Judgment Day? Now, let's read another verse. Uh, Bratam, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 3 to 5. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3 to 5. Revelation 22, verse 3 to 5. In Jesus' name, I read. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. Verse 4. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Five, verse 5. There will be no more night. There will be no need the light of a lamb or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will ruin for ever and ever. Okay. Thank you. Now, in verse 3, uh, now this is a situation uh, because Revelation chapter 22 
is the last book uh, of the New Testament. That means the last book of the Bible. And at this stage, uh, judgment has really been finalized. Okay? That means everything has been judged. Okay? And now, this scene uh, that is portrayed in Revelation 22, 22 verse 3 uh, is to tell us uh, that we're going to see one throne. And that throne is the throne of God and the Lamb. It's not telling us that there's a God and there's a Lamb, you know, but it is the throne of God and the Lamb. There's no two thrones. Uh. It's just make reference that uh, this throne belongs to God, who is also the Lamb. Okay? And why we say that? Because, uh, and his servants shall worship him, referring to one person that's only sitting there. So that lamb, uh, obviously we know is Jesus Christ. Uh, right? The lamb cannot be anybody else. The lamb is Jesus Christ. So his servants shall worship him. That means there's only one person sitting on the throne. Okay? And they will see his face. His face, you know, there's only one face on it. Okay? So there's one person sitting on the throne. The servants will be able to see his face. And his name, uh, his only one name, uh, will be written on the foreheads. So basically what it's telling us is that uh, at the end, uh, when judgment day is completed, when everything is concluded, uh, and we see God appearing on his throne, sitting on his throne, uh, we all will be worshipping him, uh, and uh, we will be able to see his face. And who is this person? This person, because it says that the throne of God and of the Lamb. That person sitting on the throne is the Lamb of God. And who is that? Obviously, that's Jesus Christ himself. So we know uh, why is Jesus Christ God himself? Because after Judgment Day, uh, he will see Jesus Christ assuming back his role very completely and very clearly to be that God that we worship. Okay. Now, let's look at another one. Who is Jesus now? Okay. Now, this is a big question, Mark. Who is Jesus now? Now, uh, okay, we turn to John chapter 4, verse 24. John chapter 4, verse 24. Uh, go young. John chapter 4, verse 24. John chapter 4, verse 24. This is one verse that we also must be commit to our memory. Uh, a very important verse for us to understand God. Uh. It's very important for us to understand this verse and remember this verse because when we often talk about God, we must understand that uh, God is not a man. Okay. God in his natural form, uh, as the word says, uh, God is spirit. So when you worship him, you worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay. So now, Jesus Christ, we say that he has died, he has resurrected, he went up. So when he went up, uh, obviously the body uh, is destroyed. Uh, no, no more really. Uh, the flesh is gone already. So what remains is the spirit. Uh, because you, we know that when Jesus Christ was conceived, he was conceived in the Spirit. So now, he assumes back in his natural form, uh, Jesus Christ now, when he ascends, uh, is obviously, he is the Spirit himself. Okay? Um, so, now, there are many verses that I, I, uh, I think we are not read. For example, in, in John chapter 14, where, where Jesus Christ says, no, uh, God will send you the Holy Spirit. In John 16, again, Jesus Christ emphasizes, uh, it's to your advantage that I go away, if, because if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. It's as if telling the disciples uh, that, uh, I'm going to go away, but I'll send you the Holy Spirit. But what exactly is this Holy Spirit? Uh, uh, we have turned to Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Uh, uh, Priscilla, can you read Romans chapter 8, verse 9? Okay, sure. Romans chapter 
78 verse 9, Jesus' name I read. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay. So here it tells you uh, that you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. Since the spirit of God dwells in you. So obviously, uh, the earlier part of this uh, is referring to the Holy Spirit because we are asked by Jesus Christ to pray for the Holy Spirit. We are asked Jesus Christ to wait for the Holy Spirit. And the disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, the apostles, uh, all insist on uh, those members who are the believer, uh, especially you read in, in, uh, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, uh, we tell us that you must pray for the Holy Spirit. So here in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, uh, Paul again emphasizes uh, that you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. He says the spirit of God will dwell in you. But then, uh, later part in this verse, it says that anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So, is this spirit of God and the spirit of Christ, uh, are they two different things? No, it is not. Because, as I mentioned, when Jesus Christ resurrected and he, be, and he goes up, it's not the flesh that goes up, it's the spirit that goes up. And who is that spirit? Just as Jesus Christ was conceived of the Holy Spirit, when he go back to his natural form, he assumed back as the Spirit of God himself. So the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ is the same thing. Now we were asked, uh, when we pray, okay, we have to pray for the Holy Spirit. Now here it tells us, uh, could it be we pray for the Holy Spirit and then the Spirit of God comes and then there is another Spirit of Christ? No. You know, that would be very confusing. But if we understand uh, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ uh, is the same thing, uh, then it's very simple to us. Now, when we pray for the Holy Spirit, uh, we are also actually asking to pray for the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Because once the Spirit of Jesus Christ comes to us, or the Holy Spirit comes to us, uh, we belong to Christ. As simple as that. Okay. Now, how do we know that the Spirit of Jesus and the Spirit of and the Holy Spirit are the same thing. We turn to Acts uh, chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 6 and 7. Acts chapter 16, verse 6 and 7. John, can you read? Yes, Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Uh, I read. Now, when they had gone to Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Okay. Now here, in verse 6, uh, there's a mention of Holy Spirit. Okay? Because the Holy Spirit don't want them to go to spread the word to Asia. Okay? The Holy Spirit forbid them to go to preach to Asia. Verse 7, but they still attempted to go to Britannia. But the Spirit of Jesus uh, did not allow them. So in the course of two verses, uh, one after another, uh, there's the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Jesus. Now, it would be confusing if there are two different spirits, okay? But no, as we all have read in many other verses, especially Ephesians chapter 4, there's only one Spirit. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Jesus uh, refer to the same Spirit. So right now, at this moment of time, uh, who is Jesus now? When we pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, uh, and I mentioned we are praying to our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we are also praying to the Holy Spirit. You can say it. It's not like we, we pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, when the Holy Spirit, another Spirit come to us. No, it's the same thing, okay? We are praying to Jesus Christ, we are praying to the Holy Spirit as well. And the Holy Spirit will guide us. Yes? The Spirit of Jesus Christ will guide us. Okay? If there are any things that is to be done, uh, the Spirit, Holy Spirit will guide us and do things. In the same way, we can also say it is the Spirit of Jesus Christ who is guiding us. Because the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, all refers to the same person. Okay? Same person. Okay? There are no different spirits. 
Okay, and this will coincide, coincide uh, with the teaching in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, where it says uh, there is one spirit. Okay. So who is this Christ now? He's coming back to us uh, as the Holy Spirit. Now I've mentioned this uh, in my previous session uh, where Jesus Christ says, uh, a little while I'm going away. Okay, I mentioned this before. A little while I'm going away. And then a little while. I'm coming back to you again. <laughs> okay. So a little while he's going away. Yes, he's going to be crucified. And a little while he's coming back to earth again. So he's coming back to us in a different form, in the form of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So that would be clear. Uh, I'm not going to refer that the other words. Uh, I, I hope you'll search for it. Uh, okay. The last part. Jesus Christ. Why is Jesus Christ God himself? Uh, from all these things, uh, we can see that Jesus Christ is God Himself. Okay. Any questions so far? <laughs> is this topic very clear to all of us? Okay. Uh, John. Okay. Yes. Uh, no. Uh, just one. Uh, just clarification. Okay. You say Jesus is is the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> yes. And all in spirit. Then why Jesus has to say that I'm sending my comforter? Okay. He will teach you everything. Now, uh, that one will turn to John chapter 16. Uh. We turn to John chapter 16. Okay. Now, in John chapter 16, uh, John chapter 16, verse 7. Uh, this verse uh, uh, is actually to tell us that uh, the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming to us. Okay, The purpose of the Holy Spirit coming to us in verse 7 is to tell us uh, that when I, uh, verse, verse 8 especially, he says, uh, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness and judgment the holy spirit uh, comes uh, uh, for to guide us uh, and there are three things that the holy spirit will guide us one concerning sin that means to say uh, tell us what is wrong two the holy spirit will guide us uh, in righteousness concerning righteousness righteousness why is righteousness it's not enough to know what is wrong we must know what is the right thing to do. You know, a person who knows what is wrong, but do know, cannot do the right thing, also not complete. And the last thing uh, is judgment. What it means to say is that uh, if you know what is right, what is wrong, you have to know, uh, for you have complete knowledge of what to do, you have to know the consequences, judgment. Okay. So these are three things uh, that the Holy Spirit will guide us. Um, now, um, let me see. We turn to John chapter 14. Uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 26. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 26. Here it tells us, uh, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, obviously, uh, uh, for the disciples, they know what Jesus Christ says. Uh, okay? But for us, uh, yes, Right now, we got the Bible, we can read, okay? We can read what the things. But honestly speaking, uh, there are things that are in the Bible uh, and there are things that are happening in the world that sometimes it says, oh, the Bible didn't say, you know, so therefore I can do. <laughs> Not necessarily so, okay? Because the Bible, yes, it writes the letter of the law, but the Holy Spirit will guide you on the spirit of the letter. Meaning it says uh, the intentions of the spirit uh, 
the Holy Spirit will guide us. So, what is mentioned down here, bring into your remembrance all those things that guide you. Uh. The Holy Spirit uh, will guide us, teach us uh, what is the will of God. What is the will of God? So just now, John, your question uh, is that, uh, why is it the Holy Spirit? What's the difference? Spirit, what does it do to us? The Holy Spirit has this thing, okay? That thing is that, Jesus Christ is no longer around. So who is there to guide us? If Jesus Christ is no longer around and there's nobody to guide us, uh, uh, then we've got a problem. Uh, okay? And the problem is because uh, if there's nobody guiding us, uh, it's just like, no, you uh, you don't have your parents anymore. You know, you're a young kid. You know? So you run, you run wild because why? you got no parental guidance at all. So, but Jesus Christ says, I will not leave you alone. I'll give you another comforter. <laughs> Just think about Another comforter. But Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, uh, who is that comforter? <laughs> this child that is born is going to be the counselor. Okay, So the comforter, well, although Jesus Christ said another comforter, but Jesus Christ also mentioned uh, a little while I'm going away, and a little while I'm coming back to you again. So what Jesus Christ is explaining to the disciples is that, uh, yes, I'm going to go away, but I'll come to you as another comforter. So the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, Holy Spirit is to guide us uh, so that without Jesus Christ physically present, uh, we are also able to understand the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, uh, there's one verse in uh, Ezekiel. I have to scratch my head uh, as to what verse this is. Uh. Uh, because that verse says that he will guide us to know the teachings of God. Uh, I, I can't remember where it's... Anybody can read the verse that uh, when there's the Spirit will teach us. Uh, anybody? I can't remember which was. I know it's in Ezekiel. Is it 36? Verse 27. No. Okay. Yes. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. Uh, John, can you read? Yes. Ezekiel well, chapter 36, verse 27. 27. I'll read. I'll put my spirit within you and force you to walk in my stages, stages, and you will keep my judgment and do them. Oh, okay, this is a prophecy, okay? Long time uh, before Jesus Christ was even born, uh, Jesus Christ, God has really made this prophecy. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be covered of my rules. So, why is the Holy Spirit sent? Uh, you have mentioned in in, uh, in John chapter 16, uh, the Holy Spirit will guide us into what is right, what is wrong, and what is the consequences of doing right and wrong. And also at the same time, uh, we have also said that Jesus Christ is going away, but he says, I'm going to come back to you again, because in a little while, you'll see me again. So now, what is the purpose of all this? In Ezekiel chapter 30, 36, verse 27, uh, is to tell us, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes to us, uh, we will have the Spirit of God inside us uh, so that we will know what is right, what is wrong. Now, we may want to turn to this verse uh, in, in, uh, in Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Sorry, Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 26 to 27. Uh, June, can you read Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 27? Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 27. Sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 27. In the name of Jesus, I read. Romans 8 verse 26. 
Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Uh, here, it tells us uh, how the Spirit helps us as well. Okay, sometimes uh, we are asked things from God, uh, but we just don't know how to open our mouth to ask. Uh. <laughs> we just don't know how to pray. Okay? So the Spirit here tells us, uh, the words here tell us, the Spirit can intercede for us you know, with sighs too deep for words. You know? you know, so the Holy Spirit uh, is a needed Something that is needed because it's Spirit of Jesus Christ uh, coming to us. Uh, not only it will guide us, you know, the prompt us what is right, what is wrong. Uh, even in our prayers, uh, the Holy Spirit will guide us uh, so that when we pray to God, uh, we know what to say to God. You know, in the Spirit, we, we pray in the Spirit, we know what to say to God. Okay, so so John, can I, is that is that okay for you? Yes, okay. Good. okay. Thank you. Wonderful. So any any other questions? Okay. Oh, no more time, right? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, let's see the next slide. Uh. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't think we have time to uh, we go through the next slide uh, because uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, okay, this is a very interesting question. I had a 10 page, <laughs> 10 page words file uh, <laughs> respond to this question. Uh, okay. And um, actually, this will be a sermon that I'm going to speak on uh, on the 31st. Uh. <laughs> yes. So, this is part of the sermon that I'll be speaking on. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay. Uh, This, to answer this question, uh, uh, let me just show you uh, something for you to think about. Uh, something for you to think about. Okay. There is a seven part uh, answer. Sorry, I have to do this. Okay. There is a seven part answer to this question. Uh, okay. Seven part answer to this question. Uh, I. Uh, because now it's five o'clock, we don't have uh, six o'clock, we don't have time already. But uh, just you go back and you think it over. This is a seven part question about man misunderstanding of who God is to himself. Okay, what is it that because the question says, uh, let me go back to the question. Uh, basically, this question says uh, that. Uh, uh, so considering the salvation, when God foresee man will fall, why then he want to create man? Again? You know that God, man will going to fall, really? why he want to create man? Okay, you know, uh, a question that many people ask. Because uh, he says that I have a family member that believe in God, but is angry towards God, you know, because they believe that God allows sin to fall into this world and let people to have sorrows, and therefore he does not believe in God. Uh, this is not the first time I come across this kind of question. Uh, I came across another Christian uh, because uh, he himself suffered some sicknesses. Uh, and as a result of his suffering some sicknesses, uh, what happened was that he tried, he blamed God. <laughs> he blamed God for what happened to him. And he looked around, you know, he said, I'm a Christian, I'm doing all this good work and all these things. Uh, and I see so much suffering in this world. Okay. And then he, he goes on to say, son, if I am God, oh, that was a very serious statement. If I am God, I will never allow this thing to happen. Oh, this is a very serious question. Okay. So, so why does God uh, create man uh, when he knows that he will fall? And why does God allow suffering to happen in this world? So the seventh part quest answer that I have is, is that uh, is for us to think over this matters, okay? Man is understanding of God himself. What is it that man don't understand? What misunderstanding? 
What is man? Uh, what is the worth of man to God? Who is responsible for God's sin, man's sin? And then we have to talk about foresee and foredetermine. This is a question. This question on four is concerning predestination. Okay, predestination. Some people say, sir, that uh, some Christians say that if uh, since God predestined us, so therefore, do I need to do any other things to be saved? No, since it's predestined. So even whatever I do, uh, what God has planned, it will happen. So there's no point for me to do anything. I can do whatever I like. God, if God wants to save me, I'll be saved to the end. So that's what, there are many Christians in the world who say that uh, once you are saved, once you're called, or once you're saved, you're forever saved. It doesn't matter what you do. There are Christians who say this. So what is the response to this matter? Okay, And then the true value and purpose of life, uh, God's special plan for man, uh, your choice or God's choice. And then we connect all the dots uh, on all these things. Okay? But this will be next week. <laughs> okay, this will be next week. Uh, we will focus on this. Uh, after this session, uh, I will, uh, I will probably uh, give you. But I want to put it all in the PowerPoint before I do that. Uh. So, but I will be answering this question next week. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? Uh, if not, uh, uh, then I'll end the session. Uh, okay. So, uh, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to let me see, Mister. I'm going to stop the recording, uh, and we have a prayer.